Back in June, I had the pleasure of talking to Daniel Lazardo and Michael Stern, who helped to found the first optically clear glass 3D printer in the Mediated Matter Lab in MIT. They then went on to found their own business, specialising in 3D printed glass called Leos Design. The next video you'll see documents the making and assembly of their 3D printed glass at the Milan Design Week in 2017. This video and more that you'll see throughout the duration of this interview is courtesy of Daniel and Michael. If you're a student or just looking to get into digital manufacturing within craft, Daniel and Michael give really good advice of where to get started. To see more of their projects and read about their research, check out their website www.leosdesign.com.
So thanks very much, Daniel and Michael, for coming on today to talk to me. I have a few questions lined up for you that might um, be really beneficial for my students just to get an idea of kind of how glass and digital design can come together. So do you want to start off maybe about telling, me, telling us a bit about yourselves and how you got started? Yeah, um, so at, as you know, my name is Michael Stern. Um, so I went to MIT as an undergrad and studied mechanical engineering. And for me, exposure to glass was sort of by happenstance. I ran into the fact that MIT had a glass blowing program when my roommate told me there was a lottery. It's not for credit, it's just sort of for fun and it's, it's totally art based. There's, so it's a hobby kind of while you're at MIT. Um, and I got really lucky and got into this lottery and started blowing glass. And it was this sort of parallel path in my life for years. Um, and then, um, so like, I don't know, seven or eight years probably after I started blowing glass, I was back at, in grad school and I had gone, graduated and worked in industry doing rapid prototyping and development and running it out of a manufacturing shop and dealing with all these sort of CNC equipment and had become interested in whether glass could be printed. But it had always felt like a, a question that didn't, that was going to be hard and didn't have an obvious application. And in grad school, I took a class and met some other amazing people. Um, Marcus Kaiser of the Solar Center, uh, John Klein and, and Shreya Dave, who was a, a, a classmate from my undergrad. And we, within this class, had an opportunity to take on a project to print glass. And so we started printing uh, glass and exploring that. Um, and Peter Hauck, who's the director of the glass lab, was really supportive. And so that was sort of the start of that. Um, and also sort of some background about me. Um, I guess other sort of elements of me are, uh, I studied my master's in mechanical engineering as well, looking at design practices for 3D printing. And um, as I said, I worked in Department of Defense research on 3D printing. And then after that, once the glass printer became further along, I did research at MIT uh, professionally in that. And finally, uh, now Daniel and I are working uh, for Leos, our company, sort of working on making this into a sort of ongoing studio practice. So yeah, at what point then, did, Daniel, did you, did you guys start working together? Uh, yeah, so I, I was um, studying my undergraduate, or I was doing my undergraduate research at MIT in material science and architecture. And I started working just before I graduated for Professor Neri Oxman at the Mediated Matter Group. And there was a lot of different projects that related to digital design for a number of different materials. So I had done work with um, like cooperative fabrication with animals like silkworms and bees and ants and also biological materials and bioplastics and regular plastics. And the glass printing project was uh, ongoing, although I wasn't a part of it for the first year. It was sort of another one of these projects where we were trying to take um, digital fabrication into a material that it hadn't really been done before to rethink how to make things using um, some more fundamental digital tools. And um, so I very much approached it, not from the glass side, but from, from the computational design and material science side. And I started working on the second version of the, of the 3D printer um, with Michael and a, a number of other people, um, which culminated in, in a project from Milan Design Week, where we sort of showcased the capability of, of the new machine and, and the new sort of process. Um, and during that time, uh, Michael and Peter Hauk, the director of the Glass Lab, started to teach us how to make glass traditionally by hand, as it was a really sort of important part of understanding intuitively how the material moves and can be operated on. That informed a lot of how we were going to design both the machine and also the, the, the designs that would go into the machine that would get made. Uh, and so I've been blowing glass since then, which has been about four years, three and a half years or so. Um, and I do a little teaching at MIT as well, although not for a while as uh, the shop has been closed. That's really, really fascinating because you're definitely, um, it's really great to hear about people coming into it from, you know, a totally different mindset. And that's something that um, 
as you might, might know myself, my own work is that I really like to kind of encourage um, conversation, collaboration with others that have a different background and a different knowledge set. And it really, I suppose, depends on the kind of platform and how you commu communicate during these collaborative projects that just really, is op really opens up the floor to this massive skill set to, you know, achieve something like you have, which is just unbelievable. So what you had worked on was the first optically clear uh, glass 3D printer, was that right? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there, there are some questions about sort of who did what first at some level, but um, one of the distinctions we definitely drew and one of the things that compelled me from the beginning about this was I had seen um, printed glass X1 had made these sintered together and then fired glass particulate and it was opaque or translucent, but not clear. And it was so fragile that at trade shows, they would uh, cast plastic around it so that it could be handled. And for me, that was such a different and disparate experience of the material than what I had seen, which is that like you could see through it, it was clear and it was robust. And, uh, and so for me, that, those were the characteristics I wanted to see in printed glass. And so that's sort of what we did. There are some, were some other people who pursued a sort of like um, a small scale version that was uh, like maybe a, a millimeter diameter bead or sub millimeter kind of size features where we were pursuing things that were instead like a five millimeter tall layer, 12 millimeters or so wide. And so we sort of took a different direction. I think both of those things were happening at, at pretty similar times. Um, the interesting results of us being sort of such big and big scale is that you really get a lot more perceived transparency where materially it may not be that different between the sort of tiny scale and the big scale. What you see by changing that is that you don't get as much, you end up with sort of like a, almost a privacy glass feeling from the smallest stuff where the texture is so great that you, you almost, that it really changes the optics. Amazing. And then um, I've, you know, been able to see all of your fantastic work online, which kind of brings me on to my next question about what you um, think are the kind of industrial applications of the process, which you brought into your own company. But if you want to maybe talk about that and then expand on any kind of other like wild ideas you might have for it. Something interesting I would, I would talk about, I think, is what Michael was pointing out about some of the other types of glass 3D printing tools and how their scale um, maybe changes the perception of the material, uh, even though from a material perspective, they might be very similar when most or at least most um, industrial applications for things like ceramics that require uh, a very specific geometry have a lot to do much more with the molecular characteristics of the material. And so things like um, very high precision filters for things or catalytic converter type uh, structures that try to optimize how much surface area for a specific chemical reaction is I think where a lot of the additive manufacturing research goes into for ceramics and glass because that's sort of, sort of at, the, at the highest level industrial application what, what you would be doing. And uh, it, it had not been from a more design oriented perspective for sort of large scale objects, for functional objects, things that we use every day in architecture and in, in, in housewares and, and, and also through art practices was just not something that uh, seemingly had been pursued at all. And so the, the application space was quite broad for an additive manufacturing tool or 3D printer that could work at the scales that, that people make things by hand or that um, factories make objects or potentially even uh, factories make architectural scale glass. And so that's was a, a sort of an exploratory opening, I think. Um, and Leos as an entity is quite open-minded, and we have our sort of product scale and sculptural scale objects, kind of objects of desire that that we like to pour our design thinking into and our artistic pen into. Um, and and it's sort of a an ongoing dialogue to find both the kind of new design, new beauty that you couldn't find in another way, but also to implement how those things might change spaces through light or through um, potentially through the sort of uh, refraction of, of, of visual characteristics in glass. And then your website itself, I was really, really impressed 
impressed with um just kind of the sheer amount of like beautiful images and videos um how important then is it for you to communicate i guess with the audience exactly what you're achieving through the through this kind of visual footage and you know do you try to i guess put out a lot of research like written research on it as well or do you more so go for creating something that's really aesthetically beautiful to i suppose draw people in i think that's a, a good question i think that i think that one of the really important or one of the challenges of this project has been the sort of time frame and research dollars needed to do it and so one of the questions has always been, how do you fundraise alongside the project? So how do you take sort of small steps and then convey to people why this is exciting and where it might go and sort of build from there? And so I would say to, to that end, one of the important lessons is that this stuff looks really beautiful in person, but if you can't sort of share that with people, it's really hard to get people excited. So we've I would say from the beginning, put a, a really big emphasis on trying to capture what we're doing and try to make that compelling visually to other people so that they can experience that um, as a sort of means of furthering the project. Um, while we were at MIT, we did a lot of research and wrote uh, probably, we wrote three, two journal articles, three journal articles and presented at some conferences and, um, and and that sort of remains something we would like to do. But as a company, I think we have a little bit of ways yet to go to get to a point where we have the the stability that we can have like a full, create a sort of large enough space for doing kind of our own academic research as well. I also think that um, from, the, from the perspective of, of generating content, particularly as a designer, um, or, or a student of design, uh, there's been a, a, a huge amount, I think, of, of new understanding that comes from making an effort to, to frame what you're doing in a specific way, to try to see it through a specific lens. And um, kind of every time we uh, go to print glass and, 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 and photograph it, and every time we go to, um, to take a, a piece that we've made or, or an installation concept and, and go to photograph it in some way or to take a video or to put somebody in in the space and, and, and photograph them has always sort of yielded new and interesting ideas and results um, because it, it's just quite a complex system. I think photographing glass is, is like a very interesting, almost tangential uh, discipline of photography that um, we've spent quite a lot of time doing and it's, it's kind of interesting because I, I I spent sort of dozens and dozens of hours photographing glass, but I, I don't think I would necessarily be all that great at photographing other things. <laughs> so this is quite a specific thing. And I've talked to a number of glass artists who also have this experience where it's, it's sort of a hard thing to capture. And then when it's doing such sort of transformative, interesting things with light, then it becomes um, even more interesting thing. So there's a lot of kind of failure involved in, in photographing things and trying to create uh, visions of what we're doing or to try to find new visions of what we're doing. But it's always been quite fruitful, I would say, at, from a design perspective to see new ways that this could be seen by people. Um, and has also really sort of helped inform the research side because it's, we're, we're I would say, doing research without a lot of, of known boundaries. We're talking about a, a added manufacturing system that exceeds in many ways what the sort of standard um, uh, sort of parameter set is for a lot of systems. It's, a lo it's much, much faster. It's obviously much hotter um, and uh, just operates in sort of different spheres. And so comparing it to other things is, is quite difficult. And so we're, we're sort of trying to chart a little bit of new territory and having um, sort of a, a comprehensive content set that, that shows what's going on has been extremely useful in, in sort of making that research have impact as well because it's sort of one thing to say well it's it's better in these ways or it's worse in these ways but that's not quite the when you break it down it's not quite the the relevant conversation you're trying to ask questions about something that's 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 pretty different i would say that's fabulous and um for you as well during the project what 
because as you said this is a much quicker I suppose, 3d printing um process than a lot of other materials that we would be more used to 3d printing what though were the main challenges that came with that and actually dealing with the heat and having to i guess set up an extruder that could handle the heat and a printing plate one of the main challenges i think is that to go to this high temperature you either go to make a lot of things out of platinum or you make them out of ceramic and what that means is you have a lot of delicate ceramics because for normal people, you can't afford platinum. So because it's so hot and it's big, it moves quickly. And while, and there's just a lot of room in the end to have things go wrong fast. And so what, and then you break ceramic parts that are expensive and then the sort of your whole effort to print kind of ends. Uh, at that point, and you've done significant damage to the machine and, and you have a bunch of repair work to do. And so I think one of the biggest challenges is because of the speed of it and the sort of like uh, the inertia of like of everything thermal and sort of physical, once you get going, you're sort of going and then you can have very productive periods where things are working and you're getting a lot of stuff out or you can have a moment of inattention which I think is sort of common to the glass making process and then everything goes wrong um, and sort of comes apart. And so I think that has been a sort of an ongoing challenge to, for us to sort of work on. What I think is quite cool about the team that we were working on was that it was, Mike by far has more knowledge about industrial additive manufacturing than, than I guess anybody I know. And uh, as one node in a team that was not necessarily like the the like only approach. I think if you approach trying to make a 3D printer only from the perspective of somebody who makes 3D printers, then it's quite an uphill battle. But but Mike also knows about glass, uh, like hot shop equipment that's much more sort of made to be not necessarily moved around, but to be moved and, and, and to be worked by hand. And, and, um, and we worked with a number of other glass blowers and equipment makers who kind of knew how to make things for molten glass, not for plastic or metal. Um, and so to approach it from that angle was much more intuitive and quite interesting to, to have, to have all these pieces come together that were not 3d printer components. They were glass components that then sort of were thought about how to make them operate as a 3d printer. So initially what, in the 3D printing world would be called the build chamber, which we still call the build chamber, was we was colloquially called the anneal, annealer because that's what it was based off of from the glass equipment manufacturer who was designing it with us and making it. And so you had this kind of coming together, this sort of large scale computer controlled motion system with all these sort of hot shop equipment pieces that people kind of knew about already, um, but that then were sort of reframed pretty holistically to become a machine. Um, which is a unique thing, I, I think, from a design perspective. Normally, it's a little bit more uh, directional where you're, uh, where you're starting and where you're going. So, that's, I, I think that made it less of a challenge, but it was quite, uh, quite cool to see all of the different minds in action. Yeah, I think I think that's um, a good point, and and that's not that was no sort of accident at some level. I think the yeah, realization was that this is going to be a real uphill climb to make a printer, and so the question was, how many pre-existing things are there that we can use that mm. can pretty much work almost off the shelf? So in the very first generation of the printer, it was a collection of scut kilns that were were two of them kind of almost three that we'd sort of modified one that Jim gave us sort of electrical controls for and then two two others that um that we just sort of took off the shelf and and modified a little bit and so which left us but there's always been this challenge I think one of the biggest technical challenges has been around the nozzle because the nozzle doesn't look like anything in a typical hot shop and so there's been a lot of effort there that has been much harder to do for us because we've been sort of inventing our own kind of thermal system to heat a nozzle and that you can't go get it off the shelf to do that. And, but for the places where there exists glass blowing equipment that looks like this, even if the function is quite, is sort of somewhat different, there's been a lot of opportunity to work with really great tool makers to, to help us get that 
sort of and to do something new I, I, yeah uh, when we were working with um, spiral arts to make the build chamber it was basically an annealer without a ceiling but then it was also an annealer with lights inside and windows and um that was something that they had never made before they thought were, that was extremely cool testing these sort of like um yeah these big french doors with with big plates ceramic windows and these bright lights so we could videotape what was going on and see the printing process because normally there's not a lot to see inside of an annealer <laughs> yeah and if you definitely if you open the door to have a peek inside that's when you get shouted at <laughs> yeah yeah and being able i think free to capture that in video um kind of what you were saying earlier is so important just to communicate to the audience no matter what their background is whether it's from glass or looking at additive manufacturing or from industry I think it's that's what kind of brings it to life is actually seeing the footage of it being 3D printed. So well done to kind of keep pushing with that to um, kind of make these bespoke bespoke uh, fittings for between the nozzle and the kilns and everything. And that kind of naturally brings me on to the next question I was going to ask. And um, I just really want to ask you, why do you think it's important to combine traditional craft with digital technologies? This is something we, we've been thinking about recently because we we actually were were applied to the for the Burke Prize and we're thinking about how craft and digital technology sort of come together and so spent some time really pondering this and one of I would say the questions that we found ourselves asking was um, how how does technology and the sort of advance of technology and the building of tools impact craft. And, and, in, and in glass, it sort of feels very clear that we don't manipulate it directly. We're always sort of in, impacting it with tools. And so there's this real opportunity to be innovating with tools, to innovate with craft. Um, so that's sort of part of the answer. And then the other piece for me is that glass is a material that requires, it has so much sort of opinion of its own almost, like a, and, that that I think that an approach that works well for it is one that is quite humble to it and, and gives you an opportunity to to think about how it behaves and why it behaves that way. And I feel like I got all of my sensitivity for that from handling the material in a studio. Um, and that sort of connected back to to then be an opportunity to think about how craft connects to technology and can technology be an extension of the hand at some level. And wrapping back to the last question about windows and talking about windows was there was a real effort beyond even wanting to be able to take video of it, although video was sort of a, a key question. One of the other realizations was when things went wrong, the only, you couldn't feel it anymore. So you had to sort of see it and then really try to intuit based on our own knowledge of how glass feels and behaves, what the machine might be feeling and the object might be feeling. And so, the windows, we spend a lot of time staring at the wind through the window and looking at the object being made and seeing how how different geometries impact what's happening and how the sort of different research, different feed rates, different layer heights all impact what, what comes out. Um, yeah, and internalize that. Yeah, that, that's, um, I think that's really, really incredible. And it kind of reminds me of, um, Pirac Sun's work um, in yeah. the ceramic 3D printing um, and how he purposely pushes um, playing with the layer heights and working with programs like Grasshopper to just see what the outputs of it are. But I, in my own work and like my own research, um, I've called into question this notion that a lot of maybe people who are very they're emotionally and invested in traditional craft might see digital technologies as taking away some of the authenticity of the object and this was something that I suppose in my own practice was something I tried to explore and change through, through just communication with the audience throughout the whole making and research process but one of the main things that I came to kind of understand through learning how to work um, with kind of 3D printers and technicians who work in fab labs is that actually the human to machine uh, relationship in, in, these, in these fabrication um, facilities 
is quite close and it's really quite similar actually to traditional craft and that you actually have to use use these machines in the same way that you use a hand tool. Yeah, I think there's a very interesting question of exactly what um, what it means to intuitively understand a process and what it means to understand which aspects of a process are directly influenced and which aspects of a process are not. And this goes for everything from fully top-down digital design to a manufacturing system that you never see to making something by hand and understanding how the sort of eccentricities of your own body are going to be affecting the thing that you're making. Um, and I, I have this sort of very strong feeling that those that the um, that the kind of known and unknown are um, not so decoupled uh, in the world of making, and that they have this quite interesting dialogue actually about how, when you need to know what's going on and when you don't need to know what's going on, and exactly how those things come together is something that uh, a sort of master craftsperson will do very well intuitively, and I think also somebody who is an expert in computational fabrication may also do so intuitively through through uh, sort of uh, th through their programming and, and, and a keyboard um, but there's quite a lot of interesting stuff in between and even as we get greater understandings about things like biomechatronics and, and how human beings have their own how you might computationally control your own appendages not from a computer but how your brain actually does it how that differs between different people um starts to raise a lot of of, of interesting questions um and and it, it's true if you if you have a 3d printer yourself or if you have a sort of computer controlled um, fabrication system it is not necessarily and almost certainly for the better is not something that you can just know exactly what's going to happen. You, you want to see um, how it's taking whatever it is that you've designed and, and putting it into something that then gets made. And, and there's always a slight difference and understanding how that's different is part of understanding the kind of craft of making that thing. Um, and the glass 3D printer has just been more specific about exactly how it translates something from a three-dimensional object in a computer space into into a physical object um, so much so that we don't really design 3d objects to be made what we design is the motion of the machine itself because what gets rendered is so different in critical ways i mean it has this texture that other 3d printed objects also have although you tend to be able to sort of ignore it for hours you really can't um, and so that becomes uh, an integral part of the thing that you have to design. And you're not really going to design that in, on a computer. That's just the thing that's going to happen. Um, at the same time, the behavior of the printing process changes depending on exactly what's going on, how fast it's going, how quickly it's turning, how, uh, and a lot of these things that, that, that Pirac um, and, uh, and Brandon work on, on like layer heights and feed rates and all these sorts of things, they change dramatically what the output is. And um, it's very cool when the input and the output don't look alike and to be able to understand the difference is, is, is quite spectacular. They, they do some really amazing versions of that in play that I really like where this sort of off axis printing where they like send the extruder far, from, like quite a far away away from the object itself and comes back and it's got this like loop or tongue and it's quite emergent compared to what you would see in the CAD file. Um, which would just be nothing like that at all. And we've, we've done similar things and things that are sort of inspired by that, although the glass doesn't respond in quite the same way, but that's sort of exactly the, that relationship that we're, that we're interested in, in designing with as a studio. Yeah, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And definitely, as you said, the outcome is, is never certain with these machines and you could design something on, on the computer and the end object is completely different. Um, and that comes down, I think, as well to even just the kind of the autonomy of the object as well, um, that it kind of demands that in, in the end. It's not something that is just kind of is at our will. Um, and that's something that I talk a lot about in, in, my, in my work. There's a brilliant book called um, Emotionally Durable Design, which 
might be familiar with by Jonathan Chapman. And he talks about the, uh, the Swiss army knife effect of objects. So things like our smartphones where they kind of, they just perform so well that when they then misperform, we end up getting angry and we're quite dismissive of them. And we think they're performing badly as an object. But if you've got um, a kind of a glass object or a craft object that has these little kind of um, mischievous like behaviors in them already, it automatically demands, I think, more respect for it. So then um, I was going to ask you, would you have any advice for um, students or young designers or makers that would be looking to get into CAD processes within their craft? Um, I, I think one one piece that that the question that I've gotten about where we've gone um, from certain people where there were someone a student once said to me like how do you get we could never do this you have to have been at MIT to to have made a glass printer and I, and I don't think that you do I think that the like particularly every year it gets easier to assemble a collection of stepper motors and, and make something move in three dimensions. And we can take our intuitions about the process and about the material and start to apply it to these, with these technologies to do interesting things. And so just to take it piece by piece, the first experiment with a glass printer was a flower pot and a ladle of glass and then sort of progressed to something that was very crude um, and produced really imperfect objects. And it was sort of like one piece at a time, you sort of take these small steps and you keep going. And we've been printing glass now for six years and it, it takes a long time at first for some of these things, but it doesn't need to be, I think, like an all at once process. So it's often, how can I decompose this into a tractable, bite-sized question that I can start to approach um, as a student. I think that's exactly, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, one of the most inspirational like courses or projects I've seen um, was at uh, the Center for Ritz and Adams at, at, at the MIT Media Lab. And the project was, I think she called it Gestalt. And basically a, a friend of mine, uh, Nadia Peek, decided to try to decouple every aspect of digital motion for, for anything, whether it's a CNC lathe or a 3D printer or a wire EDM cutting machine or, um, and to take all of those sort of degrees of freedom and, and axes of motion and then um, put them, lay them all out on a table and then just start from scratch and think about different things. She's done it with a few different uh, classes of students from like, high school students to to grad students and, and places around Cambridge and around the world at different fab labs and and they come up with some pretty intensely interesting um totally new machines from things that like uh make zen gardens with sand to uh, there was a team in Japan that made a very specific cutting tool for daikon radish which is like a, a kind of a finessey thing that you do in Japanese cuisine is to, to thinly slice that and, and also just all sorts of things. And it's like when you really just break it down into these little modules of, of uh, this thing goes here and then start to build them just by your own intuition, you don't need to be you know, a, a real programmer to kind of think that way. That's, that was a really fun example to see. I, I, I can sort of send you, I think, the, the video from that project. There's hundreds of different ideas that people came up with. Um, and from the perspective of learning digital tools, that it feels like there's quite a barrier to entry and I think that there isn't, but it's sort of very understandable why, why it feels that way. I teach, um, or I did teach at MIT this kind of beginner CAD class for a group of, a mixed group of architects, engineers, and economists, I suppose, business students. Um, and um, which is quite a weird, uh, thing and quite a mixed response to like starting to use Rhino from scratch. I think I think we taught Rhino and Onshape, which is the in-browser version of SolidWorks. Um, and uh, and I think it's the thing to take away for those students was that there isn't if you just want to have an introduction to be able to do something in the digital space is that there isn't quite a wrong way to do something. 
there's a lot of, I mean, there's certainly a lot of inefficient ways to do things. And, and for every program, there's, there's hours and hours of ways to, to learn how to do it really well or to work with the kind of framework that's set up by the software. But the reality is it's, it's, it's discouraging to sort of feel like you need to know how every step of the process works or need to know how the whole software package works, but to just sort of start to make curves and put them together or to start to make objects and, and um, to be a little more free is I think hard, particularly once you're already an expert in something else. But that's, I think the key is to just really kind of not uh, feel like you're doing it wrong, even though there's so many ways to do it. And what we tried to do for that class was to spend like a week um, giving a real overview of like, here's what you might be able to do with this program in general. And the assignments were very small scale, like just make a thing that you might print or make a thing that you might use. Um, and yeah, it's sort of looking at the kind of high level and the low level without getting too messed up about the, all of the stuff in between, because that's just sort of takes time regardless of how good you are at it. Um, even if you're a total expert in one CAD program, sitting down to the new one is, is almost as hard as it would be for somebody who hadn't uh, done any work before. Absolutely. I'm in the middle myself of um, switching over from being used to Rhino to learning Fusion 360. Um, so I can fully agree that it's like you're just learning from scratch all over again. But it's good because I, I think it constantly puts you in the mindset of someone who's, start, who's starting as a beginner and learning it from you. So I guess it constantly you know, reminds you to be humble about your approach to it and just inquisitive and put in the time to relearn it as if it's a new tool. Yeah, and just to not mm -hmm. feel like that there are people who are good at this means that I, I have no place here is sort of like an easy, an easy well to fall into, but, but it's, it's the thing you got to avoid. I, I think I was also going to say that it just requires like, I, I agree sort of like a gentleness with oneself about how slow sometimes progress is and um, a lot of patience. Like, I think that they're like, sometimes it's, you plug one thing into another thing and you're running into some like, JSON like protocol that you need to have set up to get something to connect or you discover that you plugged your router and in, into the same outlet for your CNC mill as the controller and it's creating electrical interference it's like there's so many sort of little pitfalls that I think one can fall into that it that it's just sort of like one has to sort of often it's just sort of time and, and perseverance and 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 patience so I, I agree with what both of you said on that. I think that's an important method, message to students. Yeah, I think so. And probably across the board, patience and just putting, putting the time and allowing, allowing those frustrations to arise um, and accepting that actually from them is a big problem solving opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. And they can be, yeah, they're just going to happen. And it's, it's sort of more interesting to think of them productively. I think we had this one thing with the glass printer where we were seeing some electrical shorting for a few days. We couldn't figure out why something was underpowered. It was really eating at us because we were in the middle of printing and it just takes all of our energy to do that anyways. And we were standing on top of the printer loading it with glass. I was holding the gathering ball, which is a steel gathering ball type mm -hmm. thing. And I grabbed onto the ceiling and got a shock. And we went down this crazy rabbit hole of thinking that something was like electrically live. And it turns out it's just the like, electric furnace and having a pipe in there, which I think most glass blowers sort of know about, like you shouldn't blow, um, like you should blow into a pipe while it's in an electric furnace because it'll get shocked. And it's just sort of like all these crazy aspects. We had all these electrical systems that you might not normally see and try to figure out, try to probe it with different things to see which glass is conductive and which isn't. It was sort of like, but to just laugh about it, I think was the key. Because yeah. it was pretty, it ended up being quite funny, I think. It's amazing. I, I, I'm not sure that people know that, Daniel. By the way, that when we talked to we talked to Fred Metz yeah. about this, and I think the 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 catch twenty two to why I think this doesn't tend to come up is that you normally are just a floating ground. You're you're your own, so you, it like changes your potential, but you don't ground anything. Ah, uh, you have to be like touching a bench or something. You're saying, or, or like the, a door, well, uh, or you need to touch yeah. something that connects back to the furnace. So if you're uh, standing on a concrete slab, you'd be fine. But if you like. I don't know exactly what scenario it is, but it, but I think he said this could happen 
I'm trying to remember when he said that this would this has happened to people. It's it might like have had to do with or something or blowing. It might have had to do with his, his electric glory holes for yeah, cruise yeah, yeah. ships. That, but it was it, it was sort of a an unexpected, um, yeah, an unexpected uh, happenstance. And very fortunately, because it wasn't actually a live furnace issue, it was just this sort of magnetically induced electrical currents it was really low ex extremely low current so it just sort of felt like i think more like one of those like prop handshake kind of electrocutors right yeah it's yeah. a little buzzer <laughs> yeah like as opposed to to something sort of truly dangerous in um, a couple hundred volt range yeah I don't think uh, it's it's something that's well known, but um, perhaps maybe came to light in a most unusual circumstance for you. It is true. It's because I've only ever experienced glass making in quite weird circumstances. And I, like, I started blowing glass while we were doing 3D printing and spending a huge amount of time 3D printing. One of, the, one of my tasks early on was to shear the glass after it had been ladled or gathered or sort of uh, dumped mm. into the furnace. And we would just do that a lot because it took a lot of glass to going through a lot of glass and it might have had like a couple thousand times to shear with these huge diamond shears, which then became this odd thing that I happened to be really good at while I was struggling to do everything <laughs> else at the absolute beginner level. Yeah. All well, that, learning to blow glass. That in itself is an, an absolute massive skill to have. Like if you ask any person who does sand casting, being able to rely on someone to shear here cleanly and quickly and effectively is um, a massive skill to have. So I'm quite yes. jealous of your skill set. <laughs> we, yeah, we don't it's funny. need it anymore. Daniel, Daniel is also um, really good at, at dealing with our gathering ball too. We have this pretty big gathering ball. So you take these massive gathers on this thing as we've sort of gotten more efficient. So you can get like a, I don't know, it's probably like a 10 pound gather or something like that. So it's, it's the kind of thing where like, nor, like, I don't know, normally you'd be like, all right, this is my three gather piece and I'm gonna take a fourth gather or my four gather piece and I take a fifth gather. Daniel has sort of experienced that for the printer, <laughs> but there's like never, from a glass wing perspective, there's not, a, there's not the completion to it. So it's this really interesting skill that I'm, I'm waiting for Daniel to start making big Yeah, I've never so made that, anything remotely that so day. That, so <laughs> yeah. so that he can start putting that to play. Um, but it's, yeah. And oh, and then, <laughs> at, and then when the really amusing part of this is so after you gather in our studio, because the printer is about, it's at the other end of the studio, it's probably 50 feet away, something like that. You have to dodge three benches potentially of other people working and then climb a flight of stairs with this oh gathering ball and this big gather. So it's this really weird, like, I don't know, like, kind of odd obstacle course like, hill chuck kind of like glass olympics thing yeah. where they have like silly activities that that have no bearing it seems like J just are sort of hard to do and so but this is one of them like where we where you need in a humorous way to assist on the glass printer you need to be able to like you don't need to be able to do a lot of things but you need to do this collection of weird tasks yeah. where like now you need to take a giant gather and walk up some stairs like <laughs> no one has that skill so so as we've had a few other people assist us i'm like here's the gathering ball you need to practice going up the stairs a few times so that you're comfortable yeah. when you get there once you're holding this i'm keeping gather. it on center yeah it's a, oh that's happening <laughs> yeah it's a, yeah it's, it's very fun thing. to work in a hot shop with other glass blowers who are all our friends and, and just yeah all the sort of weird things that need to happen and weird things that are happening yeah, I'm it's sure great, it's but. I'm sure it's a great opportunity though for them to kind of start to come to the material with a completely different like a completely beginner's mindset all over again. We really like to share that aspect of the of the process with all of the the other glass boards who are, I had this sort of dream that that the design process can be really collaborative with people who make things by hand and also people who design things like um, we've worked with people who are long sort of, uh, sort of traditional glass boards have a huge amount of experience and also people have a huge amount of experience in like computational architecture and then that's what they do and, and to make huge buildings out of out of computer code basically um, and to have those two things come together would be really great and to sort of see what different glass boards could come up with to make out of the 3d printer in relation to what what more computational designers are thinking and um, 
I wish our machine was as easy to get to pill drug as Pyrox, for example, <laughs> to start to play with things. Yeah, uh, we would. But we ours would is about a ton. It. <laughs> so it's a little wow. hard to move. We brought, we went to give a lecture at RIT and we wanted to do something in the hot shop. And since the printer couldn't really travel, we decided to go back and sort of share with students some of the earliest experiments. So we brought a caldera kiln, a paragon kiln, and just did some extrusion from a little pot and then showed that you could take like a camera turntable that spins at like one RPM and you could start trying to grow objects that way so that you could decouple a printer into like a eight, like a glass printer that sort of early on stuff was sort of $800 of parts or something that went into it and start to see something that sort of gives you ideas that that might be possible. I think that when approaching digital fabrication at, at sort of any sort of stage, I think like finding other people to help you is such a big part of it. It's that you don't need to do this on your own. There's like, so there's a real community of people helping each other. Like the internet is useful, but all of that is sort of less useful than a human in the flesh who can help you think about what's going on. And I think the other piece is sort of from that end, can you create a team where, where you bring people together who have expertise in different areas? Because I think one of the things that made glass printing interesting was a, like a lot of skill that some of our team members had in generative computational design that sort of from the beginning opened up sort of areas there that we were able to really take advantage of. And that I had none of, for instance, as a glass blower and mechanical engineer, my background was was not with Grasshopper, it was some more with SolidWorks mm -hmm. or Fusion. Mm -hmm. And I think as time has gone by, one of the really exciting pieces for Daniel and I has been that we've had a chance to take over so many of those other roles and sort of educate ourselves and how do you do, how do you explore computational design and unlock additional sort of parts of this for ourselves. But that has been, each of these things is just such a big learning task that you can get, I think sometimes someplace by finding a sort of team of people where you have someone who can who can make the graceful curves that justify why you're learning to use a, a, a digital fabrication platform. Because I, I find that what I saw in 3D printing in industry was that it's very hard to design parts that actually make sense sometimes to print. With an industry, you, you have available to you all the sort of normal manufacturing equipment. So you have your milling machines and all these other things. So making a part physically is not that hard because you order it. So the question then becomes, why is it printed or why why does it need to be made by a computer? And then what you notice, and I'm sure you're recognizing in Fusion, is that so many of the tasks revolve, extrude, all these things relate to traditional manufacturing. And so trying to figure out how to get these tools to make forms that feel more organic and feel interesting and feel like they're pushing the boundaries is just that much harder for, for all these different kind of portions of the world. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you as well about the idea of kind of building up a team that have a multitude of people from different backgrounds, different skill sets. I think sometimes when you're starting off, there's a tendency to want to be able to do it all yourself and be an expert at everything and have complete, um, authorship over the project when in reality just learning how to communicate with other people and work with other people can open up the possibilities of the projects project far beyond what you'd be able to do purely by yourself there's some things from from the media and matter group that i felt like took such a nice and subtle approach to authorship um particularly some of these ideas about co-fabrication with living organisms and systems one of the like sort of maybe most poetically effective projects was the Silk Pavilion, which is a lighting dome that was created by, um, well, in part by a frame of aluminum and, and synthetic silk that was designed and, and digitally fabricated by the students who were working the project. And the rest of it was filled in by 6,500 silkworms. And to say that you had authorship over this, this very beautiful dome would be a little bit crazy because there were uh, uh, several thousand things making decisions that you were making. <laughs> and so this very interesting disconnect of something that is quite aesthetically beautiful that, that people can have a real design impact 
on as a as the sort of computational designer, and also these sort of little scale um, things that were uh, creating their own sort of slightly directed um, but autonomous decisions. And those team members can be that low level or they can be at the highest level making <laughs> decisions as big as yours are. But it's sort of in a, a very nice way, I think, to, to think about why you're making something and exactly what your hand is doing in that making process. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's completely fascinating. And that's um, something that I point a lot of uh, people that I talk to towards is um, looking at the Silk Pavilion and that I think as well as featured on the abstract series on Netflix, I think in the sec second series. Um, and it's just one of these programs that I feel you watch it. And if you watch it before bed, you're not going to sleep all night because you're, you're, I think your brain just goes on fire with all of these ideas of what can, what can be created. And it's just having, I think, a really, I guess, inquisitive approach, um, you know, to, to what can be achieved. Yeah, it's not often you see Michael Stern on, on Netflix. So thanks very much, Daniel and Michael, for joining us today. I'm sure there's just so much um, inspiration that my students can take from this. And hopefully, maybe sometime in the future, we might be able to call you in for a webinar lecture um, down the line if you had time. But thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. It's been so fascinating. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you for reaching thanks out for having us. Yeah.